Good morning. I want to welcome you if you haven't been uh, greeted and welcomed this morning. I hope you have. Uh, my name is J.D. Summers. I serve as pastor uh, alongside Stephen Parkin here at Redemption Hill Church, and we're thankful you've come here to worship with us this morning. And today we are doing something that we don't do all that often, although we've done it, this is the second time this month, is actually have an outside speaker come and to share with us. Um, about six, seven years ago, I was able to start participating in a small fellowship of pastors, uh, men who serve regionally between Kansas City and Lee Summit, all the way down to Hutchison and Emporia, Sedalia, Missouri, a number of like-minded pastors. <clears throat> and through the course of those conversations, typically uh, speaking at least once a month, sometimes more often, uh, I have been, just personally, uh, as, a, as a Christian, as a man, but also as a pastor, I've been greatly challenged, I've been encouraged, I've been instructed. And through the course of those seven years, I've come to be friends with several of those men, and Dave Hintz is one of them. And so he's been a personal blessing in my life. He's someone that I've been challenged by, encouraged by. I've received helpful counsel and wisdom from him, and he's become a friend. And not only do I get the privilege of talking with him, being a friend of his, uh, we've gotten to take our men down to his church uh, once a year for the Ironman Summit, so many of you have benefited from his ministry. And now we get the chance to have his daughter, Julia, worshiping with us here. Some of you have gotten to know Julia this year. She's a freshman at the University of Kansas. And today, uh, Dave is going to come and share with us. Some of you were with us during our Sunday school hour. You got a chance to hear his testimony of salvation, how he was brought to faith in Christ while a student at KU a number of years ago. Subsequent to that, uh, he not only worked with campus ministry, but was able to serve in Hungary for two years as a missionary. And for the past 14, 15 years, he's been pastoring at Flint Hills Bible Church in Emporia, Kansas. Um, but I know you guys, and you know me, and while we're interested in that, we're more interested in Scripture. So we're, I'm going to invite Dave to come. You open God's Word to us, and we look forward to hearing from the Lord this morning. Thank you, J.D. It's good to be here in Lawrence, Kansas, a place that's very meaningful for me as I became a, a Christian here. And so now my daughter is here as well, and she speaks very, very highly of your church every Sunday, just so you know. I have a Life360 app, and I always trace her right here. I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a helicopter parent. I prefer the term drone parent. So I have long-term surveillance where I can see how she's doing. But uh, I've always been cheerleading this church, hoping that it'll make it. Uh, my wife and I, for a long time, were deliberating where to send our kids to college, and I was concerned that if it didn't work out for JD here, it might be K-State. So, <laughs> God is good. You've got a, uh, and seriously, you've got a great pastor here. JD is wise beyond his years. Uh, he speaks with a lot of wisdom and insight, and I feel like I learn a lot from him and his perspective. And I know he loves you all deeply. He's been very excited about what the Lord is doing in this church, and I'm excited as well. And so uh, I count it a, a privilege to be able to speak to you uh, today. So let me ask for the Lord's blessing on this text, and we'll get started. Well, Father, we come before you just eager to hear what you have to say. Father, I thank you for this fellowship of believers, this island of, of Christ-like sanctification, this group of gospel-believing saints who of all places are in Lawrence, Kansas. And I pray that this message will equip them to effectively reach this community and beyond. I pray for clarity for this message. In Christ's name, amen. Well, this is a special year in the Hintz household as we are an Olympic-watching family, especially when the athletes love America. We go for those, we love those Olympics. We love cheering for the USA. And this year is special because we're getting the Olympics in, well, what was it, July? And I think in February, right? So we're getting a heaping dose of Olympic glory. And part of what makes the Olympics so special is all the pageantry that surrounds it. And it all begins with the Olympic torch lighting ceremony. I'm not an expert on this, but I have seen YouTube videos as far as what they do where they go to the home of the Olympics in Olympia, Greece, to the Temple of Hera, and you have some women dance around in Greek costumes, and they take their torch, it's not to scale, but it looks something like this, <laughs> and they, they dip it in a parabolic mirror, and the rays of the sun light the Olympic flame, and they hand it to a runner 
who takes it to the site of the Olympic Games. Now, when the Games were in Rio de Janeiro pre-COVID, the, the flame traveled, uh, what was it, 12,400 miles, and 12,000 people passed the torch. And I look at that, how the original flame went to the Olympic cauldron through this relay, and, and it's analogous to the spread of the gospel. I mean, when you think about it, we live in what was an undiscovered continent in the middle of it, and we are now reading ancient scriptures that were penned in the ancient Near East about a Palestinian peasant who was raised from the dead. So how was it that it reached this far? Well, before Jesus went up to heaven, he tells all his disciples in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I mean, that's a big job. It's a big job. And, and he asked the question, how was it that 2,000 years later it reached Lawrence, Kansas? Well, it's because they adopted a, a strategy, a shrewd one, one inspired by the Lord and one laid out for us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. If you haven't turned there, that's where we will be camping out. Now, in the context, Paul is in a Roman prison. He's not going to get out this time. He knows that the end is near. Soon he will have his blood be poured out as a drink offering. Timothy, his true child in the faith, is going to be taking the reins of a significant church movement in Ephesus, one that has been riddled by controversy and spiritual defection. In addition, Paul wants to see Timothy one last time. But for Timothy to leave this work, he has to restock the leadership cabinet. And so he gives this message to Timothy to encourage him to do so. 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul wants Timothy to pass the torch. He foresees generations of people after Timothy who will carry the gospel flame and pass the flame of the gospel to other runners. You see, this church, all churches, we're really a generation away from extinction, aren't we? Therefore, it's incumbent upon us to raise up the next generation to pass the torch. We had a brother read the, the Great Commission, which fits into this nicely. And Jesus said to them all, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, the command is to do what? It's to make disciples. And you make disciples by baptizing them. That's analogous to conversion. And then by teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, which would include the command to make disciples. You see, disciple-making is not J.D.'s job. It's your job. Everyone here, if you are a gospel-believing Christian, you are holding a torch with the gospel flame. And the question is, what are you going to do with it? Why has the Lord given you this torch? It's so that you might pass it on to the next generation. And no one is too young to do this. As I mentioned, I became a Christian at the University of Kansas. I was introduced to a campus ministry because they're offering free pyramid pizza if I would fill out the survey. And free is my favorite word, right? I go to Costco, I'm in heaven. Free samples. You're kidding me. This is amazing. But after I filled out the survey, a 
college sophomore by the name of Brian Van Winkle, who was studying architecture, reached out to me, shared the four spiritual laws with me, which I thought was the greatest. Man, this is such a succinct summary. Where did he get this? And from there, I was discipled by a college sophomore, and he was the first of a long chain of disciples that equipped me for ministry to the point where I'm talking to you today. If you've got the torch, no matter what age you are, you can pass it on, and that's what I want to help you do today. We're going to look at a threefold strategy for passing the torch. One, harness the power to disciple. Oh, it's right up there. Define the purpose of a disciple, and then select people to disciple, okay? And the application that you all are going to have is thinking through who can you pass the torch to, and what does it look like? Now, the first thing you need to do to pass the torch effectively is to harness the power to disciple. Look at verse 1. You then, my child... Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to notice how Paul addresses Timothy. Timothy is his child, not biologically, but spiritually. He was his child in the faith. Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy. Now, as his child, so to speak, we can safely conjecture that that Timothy was not as seasoned in ministry as Paul. We know that Timothy uh, was exhorted to not be timid. When he was around Paul, he was a clear second. He enjoyed being the sidekick. He was the the Robin to Paul's Batman, right? When, When Paul needed someone to do something for him, he would send Timothy, and Timothy always had the shelter of Paul. Hey, listen, I'm just telling you what Paul told me to do. If you got a problem with me, talk to Paul about it, right? That's insulation there. But when Paul is going to be off the scene, all of a sudden Timothy is going to have to branch out on his own and own every decision and teaching that he gives. And so the shelter of Paul is about to to fade. It's all going to be on him. He won't have Paul to lean on anymore. And so Paul addresses his child in the faith, and he says, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now notice, be strengthened. It's passive. Timothy is to find a strength that is outside of him, not within. The power is not inside, it's from the outside. He needs to to be strengthened. Secondly, the means of strengthening him is by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, often when you think about grace, uh, you, you, you think about saving grace, right? God's wonder-working power, we are saved by grace through faith alone, and that is grace. But God's not stingy with his grace. The grace that he gives you to, to save you is a grace that sanctifies you. And when Paul is talking about being strengthened by grace, he's not telling Timothy to come to Christ, but to lean on the grace given to you when you came to Christ. It's the grace to do one of the great callings of all humanity, and that is to take the gospel, to minister on behalf of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15.10, Paul says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than all of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Notice the fuel in Paul's ministry tank was the grace of God. Now, why is this necessary if you're going to disciple somebody? How many of you think, you don't need to raise your hand, but how many of you think, Well, Pastor Dave, I mean, who am I to disciple someone? I I barely know where Jude is in the Bible. What can I offer to somebody else? You see, there's a lot of people who, uh, who struggle with ministry perfectionism. Ministry perfectionism. 
And it's the idea that anything short of perfection is unacceptable. If I can't be perfect, then I shouldn't even try. But let's explore this logic. If I can't be the perfect spouse, I shouldn't get married. If I can't be the perfect employee, then I shouldn't get a job. If I can't be the perfect parent, I shouldn't have children. If I can't be the perfect discipler, then I shouldn't disciple anyone. If I can't be the perfect Christian, then I shouldn't convert. What's wrong with that? See, the reason why there's a gospel of grace is because no one's perfect. In fact, we're far from perfect. For all have fallen short, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Agreed? All of us are more sinful than we know. And so there's, a, there's an irony here where people are afraid of ministering the gospel of grace because they fail to apply the gospel of grace to their life. God has enough grace for, for everyone. God has given you the gospel that you can be right with the Lord on account of the finished work of Christ, that you're made righteous before him because Christ took your sin upon himself and gave you his righteousness on the cross. He's given you the Holy Spirit, which has changed and transformed you and equipped you with a spiritual gift to minister in his name. Sure, you can't do it perfectly, but that's the point. You need the gospel. Now, you might be thinking, oh, Pastor Dave, that's... I'm a perfectionist, and I don't understand grace. Why would God ever want me? Because he's gracious. He doesn't want you for your sake, but for his sake. He loves you in spite of you, not because of you. His love for you is rooted in his wonderful character, not your worthiness of it. And God wants to use you. And part of discipleship and part of ministry is a means of God's grace actively changing you. My wife could testify that I'm a better husband when I do marriage counseling. Don't nod too fervently, sweetie. It's, <laughs> they don't know yet. Uh, I'm, I'm more guarded with my eyes and my mind when I'm helping a young man work through their thought life. You see, when you do ministry and you seek to minister to others, you are changed in the process. It is sanctifying. And so don't be perfect, but be perfected as you do ministry. Now, I want to give you a little qualifier, okay? You do need to be growing. Uh, there's a vein of thought within Christianity that what qualifies somebody for ministry is their personal brokenness or being authentic. I know how to help someone with a terrible marriage because I have a terrible marriage. I know what it means to help somebody who's a terrible father because I am a terrible father. Your sin doesn't qualify you for ministry, okay? You need to be growing. And one of the great ironies of ministry, and J.D., you can probably relate to this, is that the people most qualified to do ministry think that they're the most unqualified to do ministry. And the people who are the most unqualified for ministry think that they're the most qualified for ministry. You know, sometimes people are, please understand what I'm trying to say, too humble for their own good. I can never do that. Oh, if that's you, God has given you the grace to do all kinds of wonderful ministry. Now, if you think, sign me up, I got this Christian thing nailed, talk to Pastor J.D. or Pastor Stephen before you do so, okay? I'm going to give them more work. You know, discipling someone is not about an ego trip, it's not about accentuating yourself, it's not about expanding your brand, it is about helping people. And when you're at the service of someone else, you want to help them to grow. So one, you harness the power of the disciple, and then you think through, 
what is the purpose to disciple? You need to define the purpose. You've got to have an, the, the right objective. That's my second point. Define the purpose of a disciple. Verse 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So when you enter into a discipleship relationship, you need to ask yourself, what is my objective? What am I trying to do? What am I trying to accomplish? Now, Paul's very transparent in his purpose. He knew that because there was a large defection of spiritual leadership in Ephesus, that Timothy needed to restock the ministry cabinet. He needed to raise up elders who would continue the work of the ministry. And that is why he tells him, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He wanted him to, to pass the torch. And what is the torch? The torch is what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. This is a reference to Paul's public declarations. What he said in the presence of Timothy, in the presence of others, the, the sermons and the messages that he gave. He tells Timothy, what I have said in the presence of many witnesses, you take that content and you transfer it to other people. This is the deposit. This is what he has been entrusted with. This is the content of doctrine and the gospel. And Timothy needs to make sure that what he conveys is what Paul taught. And he can look at some of the other witnesses. Do you remember what Paul said? Is this what he said? Is this what he meant? That is what's to be transmitted. Which is why Paul takes great pains to tell Timothy that you need to make sure that you're teaching the right thing. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Do you guys have any family recipes? Aunt Vivian's carrot cake? Given to you from generation to generation? At some point in time, that index card gets kind of old and dilapidated, so you go electronic. You, you have to accurately transpose it to the electronic medium. And if you get a recipe wrong, it's no longer Aunt Vivian's secret recipe carrot cake. Right? The gospel needs to be transmitted accurately. And you know what? Timothy helped us with this effort. Why do you think we have two books written to him? Because he kept the letters. And he shared the letters. I find it amazing that we can read the original writings of Paul. By God's providence, he has preserved the scriptures for us. We have the original source material given to us in all his glory. And that was something that was handed down from generation to generation. We have a fail-safe with the Bible. Now, when you look at the Olympic torch... The Olympic torch is specially designed because there were a few disasters in the torch relay. 1976 in Canada, where they were going to Montreal, rain came and it doused the torch. It made it all the way from Greece and got extinguished in Quebec, of all places. <laughs> and so, when no one was looking, an Olympic official took a cigarette lighter, right? You can see French Canadians doing this, you know, and then just lit it again. It didn't come from a parabolic mirror, but, you know, it'll work. But now they have a specially designed torch that has two flames. There's the, the yellow flame that does not burn quite as hot, and then there's a blue pilot light flame built into the torch. So if it goes out, they just click, 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 lights again, same torch. You see, we have the fail-safe where even if the gospel can be lost for a generation or two, we have the deposit in the scriptures. That's why being a man of the word, a woman of the word, understanding the word is the fail-safe to make sure that you are transferring the deposit to someone else, okay? So to pass the torch, you need to have the torch. But then you need to find a runner to carry it when you pull your hammy. 2 Timothy 2.2. And what you have heard from me 
and the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, I want you to notice four generations. Paul to Timothy to faithful men who will be able to teach others. One, two, three. See, and this is not a new strategy. It's actually something that he picked up from Jesus. It is fascinating to see how Jesus prepared his disciples to reach the world. In Matthew 9, 37 to 38, he looks upon the crowds, and this is what he says. He said to the disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. With an abundant harvest out there, he looks around and he wants more harvesters. And when you look at the book of Matthew, you see his strategy play out. First of all, you see how he calls Matthew, Peter, James, John, Andrew. They all leave their vocations behind and they follow Jesus. When you look at the major discourses of of the Gospel of Matthew, they begin where Jesus sits down and he teaches his disciples. He wants to make sure that they get it, which is why we have the major discourses, incidentally. They remember the word in the presence of many witnesses. In Matthew chapter 10, we see how he sends them out on a trial run. Go out and do ministry to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, he never forsook the crowds, but Jesus' ministry was focused on a small group of men. He ministered to them very intensely. And if you were to look at the numbers of Jesus after he went up into heaven, it didn't look so good, right? But he told them, Go and make disciples of all nations. Now, can you imagine being told by Jesus, see that big world out there? I know you've never left Palestine, but you're going to cross oceans, rivers, and mountains and tell all these nations about me. But lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. There's the power there. But there's a strategy. Now, work with me here. This is for illustration purposes only. Let's say the Lord came to you in a dream and gave you a choice. You can lead one person to Christ every single day for the rest of your life. Or you can lead one person to Christ every year, but in the next year, the two of you will lead two people to Christ. Then the four of you, four people to Christ. See where I'm going with this? What would you choose? Every day or every year? Every year. In 34 years, you would reach the entire world population. In contrast, you'd reach 12,410 souls the other way. You see, there's a genius in this. It's not evangelizing everyone. It's making disciples of all nations. It's finding people to pass the torch. And what you want to do is you want to make disciples. You want to make mature Christians. You want to have people understand the depths of the faith. You want them to to practice personal holiness, learn how to do ministry. You want them to become mature Christians. In fact, what's the difference between a mature human and we'll just say an immature human, a child. What's the difference between an adult and a child? Well, there's size, level of development. But ultimately, what sets apart an adult, what makes somebody an adult, at least biologically, is the ability to replicate. And just like we don't want to have uh, kids have kids, we want them to be adults and then have kids, We want to raise up disciples and young people so that they can replicate. And to replicate, there's a level of maturity. You want them to be able to identify and address their own sin. 
You want them to know how to um, identify where they have gone wrong. You want them to be able to feed themselves, right? Mature Christians don't constantly need to be told what to do. They know how to walk with the Lord. They have a level of maturity that allows them to replicate. And so you want to find mature Christians with the ability to replicate, and then you want to encourage them to replicate, give birth to more spiritual children. So that is the purpose. So we talked about the power, we talked about the purpose. Now we're going to talk about the people and the importance of selecting the right people to disciple. Verse 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now I have a friend who always tells me that when the student is ready, the pupil will appear. I don't know where he gets it from. It kind of sounds all feng shui, but, but it makes sense. When you have the right pupil, they're easily taught. They're easily taught. Now, when you look at who Timothy is to target, there's really two categories. Number one, they have to be faithful. Now, to be faithful in the larger context where Paul is addressing the, the heresy as well as the immorality of these false teachers, to be faithful is someone who's faithful to doctrine and not just knowing doctrine but living it out. These are faithful men with doctrinal integrity, not only in what they teach, but also how they live. We also see that they are able to teach. They needed a certain amount of competency for the job, right? He's raising up future elders. These elders are to teach and defend the scriptures. So Paul wants high character men with a certain ability to continue to do what Paul and Timothy both do. Now, I will say this. This is specific to the application of what Paul is looking to Timothy to do. Naturally, there's going to be a leadership transformation and a handoff here at this church. Old nursery workers have to be replaced by new ones. People who know how to do the facilities will have to pass it on. The sound techs will have to pass on their knowledge. Sunday school teachers will have to pass on their knowledge. There always is going to be a generational handoff. And what Paul is looking for is, one, people who are faithful, and then people who are capable of taking the next level. That's why not everyone is called to be a preacher, but you are looking for someone who's equipped to do the job you want to have them to do. Now, implicit in this is somebody who's available. You can't train somebody who's not there. You can't train a flake. So you look for who's the person that's showing up. Who's the one who stays late? Who's the one who offers to help? Those are the people who are available that you can pour yourself into. And incidentally, I think where disciplers go wrong is they pick the wrong people to disciple. They don't go for the person who's faithful or the person who's available or the person who's teachable. They go for the person who's gifted. Now, as J.D. mentioned, I was a missionary in Hungary for about two years, and, and Hungary is a wonderful culture. Very, um, very much they prize friendships in a very deep way. They don't accept superficial American friendships, and I had to adjust to that. And after ministering there, I had to take stock of who did I really want to pursue a deeper friendship with? And who was I going to give more of my time to? And I was at a crossroads between really two possibilities. The first one was Greg. It was Gergay, but I called him Greg because I couldn't pronounce his name. And Sabi. And the Greg was an aspiring medical student, and Sabi was an aspiring lawyer. These guys were extremely popular charismatic, well-spoken, a lot of fun. I traveled to visit them in their homes and got to know them on a real personal way. I really enjoyed meeting with them. However, I couldn't get them to come to church with me. They would meet with me, but they wouldn't come to my Bible study. 
Now, the other possibility was a man named Istvan Varga. He was a tall, gangly guy, um, socially awkward. Not a lot would draw you to him. But he was a man of profound integrity. In Hungary, the way they did the university system there, they would always tell the students that it was a closed book test. But all the students cheated anyway. And so the professors would design the test so that you almost needed a cheat sheet to pass. But Istvan would not take the bait. And he flunked his class. And in the semester between when he was out of the university versus when he got re-enrolled, he actually polished ball bearings at a factory for 50 cents an hour. But he was a man of integrity. So who would the world have me to choose? Well, Sabi and Greg, that's the future there. They're the movers and the shakers. They're the ones with clear giftedness and, and pull. But the word of God said faithful, available, and teachable. And so I went with Ishvan. And to this day, he is a pastor who's involved with the Word of Life Bible College in Hungary. He was who the Lord would have me disciple. You see, if you want to be discipled, if you want someone to teach you what they know, ultimately you have to be the right kind of person. You be the person that is easy to teach, easy to instruct, that is available, that takes your faith seriously. And those people will find you and pour into you. So when I look at this church, I see all kinds of possibility. The fact that a mile that way is the University of Kansas, and you have people from all over the world coming here, gives you guys a unique opportunity to reach the nations right here. And part of the means of doing that is making sure that everyone here is equipped to pass the torch to the next generation, right? To review the outline is to harness the power to, to, to disciple, to find the purpose of a disciple, and select the people to disciple. And, and this might seem a little bit overwhelming. Hopefully you are all sufficiently convinced that this is what you need to do. But I'm going to consult the book of Dave right now. It's not in the Bible. The book of Dave. I want to give you five bonus uh, commands that I think will help you realize this in a practical level. Okay, the first command, be the right kind of person. Be the right kind of person. If you want to disciple someone, be the right kind of person. Now, some of you might understand that, yeah, I want to be the right kind of person, but I'm not the right kind of person right now, so I, uh, I think I need to be discipled because no one seems to be asking me to disciple them. That's you, good for you, right? You are self-aware enough to know that you need some additional training. And so you go to Pastor JD and say, uh, Pastor JD, I, I really want to disciple people, but no one's asking, so I'm hoping that maybe you could disciple me. And JD says, well, you know, you've got a lot of potential and stuff. I, I tell you what. Brother Jed over there is a great guy. He's been married for 30 years. He's active in ministry. He's raised believing children. You know, I'll, I'll put in a word to him, and, and maybe you can start meeting with, with him. And you think to yourself silently, well, Pastor J.D., you don't understand. I, I thought I was of a higher caliber than being discipled by Brother Jed. I mean, he's great and all, but he's, you know, look at the potential here. Well, Keep that to yourself because J.D. knows your potential and that's why he's sending you to Brother Jed. Because he knows that if you're not willing to be instructed and taught by Pastor Jed, you're not going to be instructed by him. Who disciples you shouldn't be a status thing. If somebody is godly and knows more than you in whatever area, be easily taught. Be the right kind of person. Secondly, focus on your family. For those of you with kids in the home, you have an immediate discipleship opportunity. 
If you don't disciple your own kids, who's going to do it? The school? Well, that's why we need to hire a youth pastor. No. Youth pastors can supplement your discipleship. They don't replace it. Be intentional about meeting with your children. Ask about them. You know what? You know, how's school going? Tell me about your friends. Um, check their internet history. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4. It is a role of the parents and the fathers, specifically with their sons, and I'd even say mothers with their daughters, to, to help them understand what it means to be a godly man or a godly woman. And talking about eldership, in 1 Timothy 3, 4 through 5, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? You focus on the family. And incidentally, if you are a mother who is thoughtful and intentional about how to raise your children, other young mothers will find you. How did you get your kids to eat something other than dino nuggets? I want to know. Why do your kids come here when you don't count to three? You just say, come here and they obey. How does that happen? Titus 2, 3 through 4, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are able to, they are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children. If you do this well, other people will find you. Three, look for disciples. If you can't find someone to disciple, share your faith a lot. And when someone comes to Christ, disciple them. You will know more than them. Instead of trying to like poach disciples, you make disciples. Share the gospel. Secondly, just as you're serving with someone, Oh, you're new here at this church as you're doing dishes together. Tell me about your story. How did you come to Christ? Well, I just started coming here. Really? Do you have any church background? Well, I grew up Roman Catholic, but, you know, I felt I wanted to do something different. You know, that should make your ears tingle, right? What an opportunity. Well, let's get coffee together sometime. Oh, that would be great. You buy the coffee. You talk to them. You meet with them. You ask them questions about their life and their story, and then you know what, what would you think about maybe getting together and just going through a book? You know, there's this great book called Trusting God by Jerry Bridges. You read a chapter, I'll read a chapter. You underline the five most meaningful sentences in the chapter. I'll do the same, and then we'll just share what we learned. Boom, instant discipleship. Just ask. Worst thing they can do is tell, tell you no. Fourthly, be purposeful. Have a general strategy. What are you trying to accomplish? You know, if you're kind of business-oriented, you have the SWOT analysis. I wouldn't recommend this with women, but with men, you could probably get away with it. Let's talk about your strengths, your weaknesses. What opportunities do you have? What are some threats to your life? Just do an inventory. Just ask him a lot of questions. Where do you want to grow? Let's talk about your quiet times. Do you have quiet times? What do you read in your quiet times? Tell me about your prayer life. How frequently do you attend church? Do you go to uh, the service? That's great. Did you come to Sunday school? Did you go to the small group studies? What's your chief sin struggle? Do you struggle with body image, pornography, anger? Where are you really blowing it? Let's talk about that. Let's set up some accountability. Focus on their character. Where do you think you really want to grow? Talk about their competency. Do you want to teach a Bible study someday? Well, let me show you how I put together my message. Do you want to work on the hospitality ministry? Well, why don't you shadow me one Sunday and I'll show you what I do. Do you want to do the soundboard? Hey, God bless you. I'll introduce you to so-and-so. And... -so. and to do this, often it takes more work, doesn't it? Sometimes it's just easier to do it yourself, but to make something transferable, sometimes you have to be a little bit more thoughtful. 
Like we have an Ironman summit here, but we also have one in, in Owasso. And that forced us to write down every single thing that we do so that we can give it to another church so that they could take the torch. And then fifth, you got to be patient. You have to have a church of patience. Right now, the youth guy at our church is giving his very first sermon. Pray for him. <laughs> Hopefully he didn't finish already. He has to stretch it out for another 15. But, you know, for, but somebody at church can say, oh, the youth guy, why is he teaching? We miss Pastor Dave. Well, they don't really say that. They're probably more excited about him than I know. <laughs> but having an attitude where isn't it great that this young man or this young woman, is, is, we're taking a chance. Or we're, yeah, it's not the greatest thing, but imagine what could happen as they develop. You allow rookies to make rookie mistakes. You see, in all of this, you're looking to, to pass the torch. By the way, this would have been a better torch illustration than a pen. <laughs> where was this all my life? So you're looking at passing the torch to the next generation, and you just don't know where it could lead. One preacher observed that in the early 17th century, a man by the name of Richard Sibbs wrote a little book called The Bruised Reed. You might have heard of it. Fell into the hands of a tin peddler who gave it to a young man named Richard Baxter, who was a famed, famous, effective Puritan pastor. And he wrote a little book called A Call to the Unconverted, which fell into the hands of a man named Richard Doddridge, who then wrote The Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul. And that little book fell into the hands of a young man named William Wilberforce. You might have heard of him. One of the great British parliamentarians who became a born-again Christian and used his influence to abolish slavery in the British Empire. In fact, three days before he died, it was finally deemed illegal. And to look at William Wilberforce and the impact he had on let's say, Charles Colson and prison ministries and others, right? When you take the torch and you pass it to another one, you, you never know where it's going to lead. Heaven will be a place where we see how we played an outsized role in passing the flame from person to person to person to person. And it begins with a conviction that you believe that you are holding a torch, right? And God's giving you a torch not just to stand around and look like the Statue of Liberty, but to actually run a course and advance the purpose of the gospel. You have been saved for a reason. You have been saved for a purpose. And it's not just your salvation. It is to be used of God to bring a grand harvest of souls. And I thank God for this church and just for the heart that you have for young people, how you are strategically positioned to reach this campus and the world. And my challenge to, to many of you is who has the Lord put in your life that you can hand your torch to? How can you make sure that the next generation will continue to run that race and continue to take the gospel to all nations? Let me pray, then I'll be done with my message. Well, Father, we are so grateful for these brothers and sisters and how they are so eager to learn your word, to absorb your word, and to spread your word. And I pray that in some small way that this would be a deep encouragement to them to pass the torch to others. Lord, I pray for those who are on the fence who maybe have not done that before or never thought that they were qualified to do so, that they will take a flyer, that they will do it, that they will look for someone to, to mentor and to disciple. I pray that there'll be some young people here who will be hungry to be discipled, who will want to grow, and that there will just be a... a beautiful, wonderful, um, symbiotic relationship between the discipled and the disciplers that will just help both of them grow closer to you and to spread the gospel of your glory to all the world. I thank you for Pastor J.D. and Pastor Stephen and the leadership of this church. I thank you for their hearts to lift up a high view of you and a high view of scripture, and I pray that that passion will spread beyond these walls to the campus in Lawrence, to Lawrence itself, and to the whole world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.